Welcome to B2B Revenue Leaders. I'm your host, Dustin Tizik. As always, this episode is brought to you by Testimonial Hero. Testimonial Hero mobilizes your customers to sell for you at scale with high quality video testimonials. On this episode, I'm joined by Kathleen Booth. Kathleen is the Senior VP of Marketing and Member Success at Pavilion. And our conversation focuses on how to use community as a revenue generator and how a lot of marketers are really thinking about community the wrong way. Hey, Kathleen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So I'm looking forward to this one, learning a bit more about community, uh, something everyone in marketing is talking about, probably rightfully so. Uh, And I feel like we're kind of all talking about different things. So if you don't mind kicking us off with, like, what is community? What is your definition of what that really means? Yeah, that's such an interesting question because there isn't really a well-defined uh, answer to it out there. And it's something that I've been working on because in my capacity at Pavilion, community is is really such a big part of what we do. And and we asked this same question last year. What? How do we define community? And so I started actually looking into this by looking at how community is defined in anthropological terms, believe it or not. Um, which funny enough, I was I was just working on this and and it I think it's like three things. Traditional anthropology defines community as number one, common interests between people, two, a common ecology or locality, and three, a common social system or structure. And so, you know, obviously you can extrapolate from there and and understand how community in, in today's world has has translated into more of a marketing term. Um, I can tell you that for us at Pavilion, how we define it is really kind of in four ways. The first is a place of fellowship. So where members go to achieve a common goal. In our case, it's the goal of achieving and unlocking their full professional potential. The The second is a shared belief um, that underpins that community. And in our, in our case, the belief is that we succeed by helping and supporting each other. And we have a commitment to do that. The third is a safe space where, in our case, members feel empowered to share authentically, be vulnerable with each other. And fourth really is a place where people form relationships. Uh, both with people who are very similar to them, as well as people who are very different. So there's this theme when you look at the research around community, around the the need to have both commonality and diversity in order to create a true community. So uh, that was probably a longer answer than what you were looking for, but this is something that's been really top of mind for me lately. <laughs> no, that's good for sure. I think, uh, you know, a lot of marketers hear community and they think, okay, I'm going to start one, which platform? And they kind of jump there, right? Instead of thinking yeah. about the foundation like you're talking about. Um, And I know what we wanted to talk about here really was how community can be a strong revenue generator. And I think most marketers understand that on the surface, but they don't really understand how and might be going about it the wrong way, probably myself included. So do you want to enlighten us a bit there on, you know, how a community can tie to the revenue side of things? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, it all comes back to like how people buy, right? I mean, yeah. And and I think the pandemic has has served as an important forcing function around this. So like I used to own a, a marketing agency years ago and and I would go out and tell people that when people needed something or they had a problem, where would they go to solve it? Well, they would go to Google. And I think to a certain extent that still happens, but really, really what what's happening more so than that now and what has always happened throughout the history of all time is when people have a problem or they need something or they have a question, they first turn to their their community, right? Or their peer group, or it's the people that they trust the most. So you can go to Google and Google will give you an answer, but Google's not as good as a place where you have that that emotional connection of trust um, in the answer. And so, you know, I'm I'm a B2B marketer. So when you think about where does your audience go for answers or to solve their problem, if I'm marketing to marketing or sales leaders, you know, they're probably not going to go first to Google if they need to find a new software solution, right? They're going to go into their community of other marketing and sales leaders and say, hey, what are you guys using? And so so the pandemic was a forcing function because I think that that has always been true, but it it was even more so during COVID because we we didn't have in-person events. We Everybody was craving connection. And so there was this immense growth in the number of communities and the level of community participation because we were seeking connection. And I think it what it did is it revealed to all of us that there was another way, a faster way, a more efficient way of learning, of getting information and of making decisions if we were to rely on our communities for that. And so I think that's why community is so valuable for revenue because 
when I think about how buyers buy today, if they if you if you believe that they start by going to their communities and asking the question, then what really determines whether you get an at bat as a business, it's less these days about organic SEO or paid ads than it is about being the brand that's mentioned within the community. And there's just two ways of doing that. One is to create extremely happy customers who are willing to go out and evangelize about their own experiences. And the second is to become a brand that people love and trust and like, regardless of whether they've ever bought from it. Um, and you see these kinds of conversations happen all the time in communities like Pavilion, where someone will say, you know, what uh, conversation intelligence software should I purchase? And all kinds of names will be thrown around. And, and the example I always love to give is, you know, you hear gong all the time. And, you know, at least I would say seven out of 10 times when someone says gong, they haven't even ever used it. They just yeah. they just love gong. Right. And so um, so it's. That has massive implications for how we go to market. It, it it has implications for how we spend on brand versus demand generation. And I'm certainly not here to say you shouldn't invest in SEO or you shouldn't invest in demand gen. Like these are all still really important things. But I think for too many years, we overemphasized our dependence upon them to the detriment of building very loved brands and to the detriment of really focusing on on truly delighting our customers as as almost like a channel, right? Uh, and so to me, that's the the table setting that that is in place for this new era of really like community led growth and community led marketing. Yeah, I think that I, I totally agree with that. Actually, that's how I buy as well. Like this, we actually got this podcast conversation started through one of those communities, right? Where I, yeah, where I posted. But same thing, if I'm going to buy a product and you use the gong example, so say I'm looking at gong and chorus. I'm going to go into one of the sales and marketing communities I'm in. I'm going to search first so I don't annoy everyone with the same question. And if it's not there, I'm going to ask. And that's how I'm going to buy. I think what a lot of marketers, especially maybe in this environment where the economy is a little, who knows what 2023 is going to bring us, they're maybe a little hesitant on this long-term play, right? And it seems easier because it used to be safe to just pour money into Google or pour money at that bottom of funnel stuff. So how do you convince people that like this isn't going to pay off this month, but longer term, this is the route to go? Well, in fact, it can pay off this month. It just depends on how you tackle it. And I would actually argue that now more than ever, a focus on community is important because if you're at all um, paying attention to customer acquisition costs, the the CAC of of acquiring customers through community is far lower than the CAC of having to continuously pay, you know, through ads or other more traditional marketing channels. Um, and the the lifetime value of the asset you're building through community participation is tremendous. So you just gave the example of you go in and you first search to see if the question's been asked before. So let's just say somebody mentioned Gong a year ago or a year and a half ago in a pavilion chat, and you go in and you search for this question, that one answer from a year, year and a half ago is still going to be sitting there waiting for you to find it. And you can keep the conversation going. So in in a lot of ways, it is actually very much like organic SEO in the sense that, you know, you're building this this longer term asset for your marketing. But it's unlike organic SEO in the sense that, you know, with Google, we can't control how those search results will change over time, whereas we can control the fact that that conversation lives on in the community. So I think there's a CAC element to it. But I also think people think about communities wrong and you know, they, it, I, I, what I tend to see is either companies that go in and recognize they need to be participating in communities and take a very spammy and salesy approach where they're, they're yeah. just there to look for the conversation where someone says, Hey, what's the best X? And if I'm selling X, I'm like, this is my moment. <laughs> and I go and I pitch and, and it's okay to do that. It's okay to answer and say, Hey, you know, I'm a little biased, but my, my company does this really well. The the thing that most people miss is that that only works if you've already been an authentic participant in the community in other ways. Because again, it comes back to trust, right? That's what we started with. The whole reason people go to communities is because they trust the opinions of the other community members. You can't go in there and just sell and expect to develop trust. You have to be an authentic participant. And so um, that can benefit you in a lot of ways. It can benefit you by by developing the trust that you need to eventually position your company as the provider of choice. But it can also benefit you through introductions, through expanding your network, through learning, you know. And so I think there's the thing that that companies lose sight of is that 
community participation isn't just about selling. It's about organically becoming a part of the community and being helpful. And in doing that, knowing that that's going to come back to you in spades. So that's one aspect of it. I mean, there's also the the avenue of you can create your own community. That is certainly a longer term play. I would say like if you have a choice between the two um, every single time, I would advise if you're looking to see revenue in the short to medium term, I would advise you to participate in communities that already exist. You know, I'm not saying don't create your own, but I'm saying don't expect an immediate payback from that. And there's a lot of nuance to how you create your own community, too. Um, you know, whether it's a user community or truly a, a broader you know, ecosystem community. Um, but yeah, it, organic participation is really at the heart of it. And training people to do that is something that most companies don't have in their DNA. They, they don't have, you know, their sales team don't have somebody who can educate them on how best to be a community participant. And so those companies that figure it out and do it well see tons of opportunities. And I was just telling this to somebody the other day who has a web design agency. And it's a friend of mine. And I was saying, you should really think of joining Pavilion. And I'm not here, by the way, to make this a commercial. It's just an example of a conversation I had. And she was like, well, I don't think right now is a great time. It's a tough economy. I'm trying not to spend a lot of money. And, you know, I'm not there to hard sell. I'm not in our sales team. And my response was, you know, I totally get it. It's just frustrating to see that there's this one web design agency that has their CEO that's a member. And this person's very active and it's gotten to know a lot of people. And they get a ton of business. It's like it's like they are spoon fed their pipeline every month because of the conversations happening and the way they're able to participate. And that's the thing that I think people lose sight of is that these conversations are occurring, whether you're a part of them or not. And so you have a choice as to whether you, you want to participate. It's, so the cost side is interesting that you mentioned there, because I was just thinking, you know, say 300 bucks a month. If I had to pitch... CEO, whoever, any company, and I said I want to spend three or more on Google Ads to test something. No one would bat an eye. Like it's, it's a drop in the bucket. It's a tiny chat, uh, tiny test, right? But for community and those brand building longer term thing, it's kind of interesting. A lot of marketers just they can't make that flip and see it from that perspective. I find, and I've been guilty of that too initially. Um, so yeah, I think that's just a challenge. That general mind shift of, you know really not that much money and it's going to be a long-term play well and especially you know you have to take into account obviously the average size of a of a new contract or customer for yourself you know like if if you're a web design agency and and you sell one website for twenty five thousand dollars that's a small website and yeah. you've spent what three thousand dollars to participate in a community like the roi is massive and that's only one um but i actually think the bigger issue for most people because i've heard this a lot even just in the past week is time there's this perception that that somehow it's going to be a drain on resources. And and I think this is if there's one thing I would want people to take away from this is to adjust their thinking away from community as this thing that you do in your own time as an extra kind of whether it's for personal development or what have you to participation in communities is the job. It's the job, right? If you're in sales, if you're in marketing, if you're a founder, a CEO, it should be a part of your job to spend a certain amount of time in communities every single day. Just like these days, I would argue for a lot of people, participating on LinkedIn should be a part of your job. And that's another community, right? Like a lot of people are getting business from these channels because they treat it as part of their job and not as a somehow an outside distraction. Yeah. And you mentioned a little bit too on training people to do that. Cause I think that's more of the holdup. I think it's a bit of a mental block of, oh, I have to post and people are going to read this. And it's natural for some, totally easy. And I think for others, even though they have a lot to contribute, it's hard, right? So on that training side, what steps do you suggest there to really help people get comfortable and actually get active? Yeah. And I guess I would never force anyone to post. Um, you know, we at Pavilion, we encourage our team to share on LinkedIn, but it's completely optional. Um, and and I would also say that you can you can build a very meaningful community by not posting anything original yourself, but by simply responding a lot and being helpful yeah. in your responses and sparking conversation and dialogue. Like that's also a very valid way to participate. So, you know, for folks out there who are introverts, don't feel like you have to be the the face of the effort. You can be somebody who simply engages in conversation in response to other people's posts. Um, but if 
people are interested in posting, you know, there's a variety of ways to go about it. I think I think the the best thing is really to encourage people that it should be something that comes from their own lived experience. And, you know, this there's a lot of different opinions on this. My personal opinion is that I like to think of it as when I learn something, sharing what I'm learning as I'm learning it or sharing the challenges I'm overcoming as I'm working on them. Because if I'm facing this, whether it's a learning challenge or some other form of challenge, odds are there are tens, if not hundreds of people out there who are dealing with the same thing. And I'm not ever going to be the smartest person in the room, ever. Um, there's always going to be smarter marketers, smarter leaders, smarter, you know, whatevers. And but there are also people out there who either are are coming behind me in terms of like they're just getting started in their career or maybe they've had different experience. And so I like to believe that everybody has something to share of value, uh, but it needs to come from a place of authenticity and coaching your team around that. Um, the other thing that I think I've seen work really well is what uh, like kind of that power hour framework where for people who are interested in doing this, everybody gets on a Zoom call together. Maybe it's over lunch. And talks about like, hey, here's what I'm thinking of posting. What do you think? How can I make it better? Like that group support is really valuable. Yeah, I like that tip a lot, actually, because it's I found the hardest thing for me and others is just setting aside the time as well, like actually blocking it. And this is my half hour. Like you would do that for a meeting or another project you're working on. But I think some people maybe, like you said, they feel not guilty, but like this isn't a job. This is me being in a community. So making that shift there, right? Yeah. Um, I, I do want to ask as well around for us, it's a little bit easier in the sense that we are marketers selling to marketing and salespeople. So we can actually be in the community. You would never send, you know, your sales rep to a CTO community. They would get banned and eaten alive and wouldn't fit. So how do you suggest picking like who your subject matter expert is, which communities to go after that whole process? You know, it's interesting because my husband works in the software field. Um, and that's why in that kind of field, you've seen the emergence of this role that is a lot of times it's referred to as the developer advocate. And yeah. so what you see happening more and more is companies that are more technical in nature, hiring somebody who comes from within the their audience population, but who has maybe a little bit more marketing or sales DNA, not to sell or to market per se, but to to really be the communicator, the evangelist or the face of the company. And I think that's a great model that any business can follow. You know, it doesn't need to be a, a CTO. It could be if you're in manufacturing, it could be, you know, the head of your your manufacturing line who's in that community. But but being able to hire people, the key in software, though, when you hire a developer advocate generally is that their job literally is to be the community participant and to create content around that. It's not to actually be a developer. Yeah. You know, they might do little projects with development kind of as demonstrations, but Again, this goes back to community participation is the job. And software in many ways is at the vanguard of recognizing this by hiring full-time employees whose job descriptions are just that, participate in the community, be the face of the company. Yeah, 100%. I've already had a couple of people on the podcast who their title is evangelist or like, yeah. it's dark social something. And that is their job, LinkedIn, all the different channels. And I mean, the fact that that's growing and, you know, there have been layoffs across the board in a lot of companies and these titles are sticking around kind of shows the value there, right? Of having Absolutely. Um, and then I guess one last question, because I know people are, are thinking it probably with the, the measurement side. And I hate to dive into this. I have a, I have a love-hate relationship with attribution. I think most of us do. Um, but working where you do and being a giant community, how, how would you suggest, suggest people measure the impact and actually tie it to revenue in some shape or I mean, there's so much discussion around this, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in attribution. Um, it's I don't think anybody really has it perfectly figured out. But, you know, I do think there's a lot of conversation around you can use attribution software, but at the end of the day, probably one of the most effective ways to figure out where your opportunity and pipeline is coming from is to just ask people, how'd you hear about us? And don't make it a drop down. <laughs> Because there's too many options out yeah. there, right? Like if I make it a drop down, somebody isn't going to necessarily see the name of this podcast in my drop down. Otherwise, my drop down would be super long because I do a lot of podcasts. Leave it as an open text field, make it required. And, you know, I think it's like a two part analysis, like look at your traditional attribution tools, but then like compare that to the information that's coming out of the forms people fill out and what they're really telling you. And that will shed a lot of light on where opportunities are coming from. 
Yeah, that's so we started doing that a few months back, like shortly after I started. And um, it was funny to actually see specific communities be called out. And like, I've never heard of that one. It's a marketing community. Like, I should be aware of this. Or, you know, we saw you on Instagram. We don't do anything on Instagram. So we're <laughs> talking about us there. Um, so it is pretty eye opening to see the power of that for sure. So I think we've talked a lot about community, tying it to revenue. Um, you know, you work for a community led company. Uh, if people want to learn more or connect with you and, and learn more, where should they go to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So you can always learn more about Pavilion at joinpavilion.com. Um, and in terms of, you know, connecting with me, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So definitely if anybody's listening and they have a question or want to connect, feel free to send me a connection request or a DM there. And you can also learn more about me at my website, which is kathleen-booth.com. Awesome. So I'll include those links in the description. Kathleen, thanks again for the conversation. Thanks for having me, Dustin. Thanks for listening to this episode of B2B Revenue Leaders. My key takeaway here is the need to carve out time to really enable your subject matter experts to contribute to their community. I've been guilty of this, most marketers are, where they view it as kind of like side of the desk thing, this takes away from my real job. But if you put in the time, actually go into it you know, selflessly trying to provide value, the long-term play here is enormous. And I think it really is just time blocking it and you know, giving yourself 30 minutes a day, 40 minutes a day to do that so that you can see the results. Thanks again for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, you can subscribe over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts. We put out a new one every Tuesday, so subscribe so you don't miss one. Thanks again.